All right, afternoon. Welcome everybody. This is our 2024 information session on the United Way of the Midlands competitive request for proposal process. So welcome everybody. Great to see you. Uh, will is recording this, so um, it will also be posted on the website and we will show you where that is in just a few minutes. Um, so again, welcome. I'm Jennifer Moore with United Way of the Midlands. I'm going to walk you through the session with Will Price and we're going to see if we can help answer some questions on the grant funding that opened about a week or so ago. So again, this is for our 2024 um, competitive application process. So what I'm going to do is we are going to walk you through some of the frequently asked questions, um, give you some what we think are helpful hints and what our volunteers are looking for during the scoring, um, and then show you the grant portal to make sure you feel comfortable in setting up your application, um, and then just kind of walk through again some of the questions and then see what questions you have. So. The basics that we'll talk about real quick is uh, again, we're a six county United Way. So Richland, Lexington, Fairfield, Newberry, Orangeburg, Calhoun. Um, so those are the counties. We have this listed in the packet as well. If you want to go back and look, um, you do need to be a current impact partner agency with us to apply. Now, for some reason, if you heard about this session and you're joining and you're not part of an agency that's currently part of that impact certification process, you are welcome to partner with one of our agencies. Um, in a few minutes, we'll show you our community impact hub page, which shows you a listing of all the agencies. And of course, we encourage our agencies to use that anyways, because that is just a great way for you to connect with other agencies, share resources, network and things like that. So uh, we're again, we're going to walk you through a few basic, basic things. Um, first of all, it is a single application, so you may be applying to support one or two different programs that your agency operates, but it's a single application. So you're going to put everything in the portal um, in one location. Um, we accept applications for basic needs and programs that also build resiliency. Um, we have a listing of eligible activities that we'd like for you to take a look at. Um, and then we also make sure that your program aligns with the outcomes and indicators that we track. And Will will talk probably a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, just to keep in mind, we do have other funding that is open from time to time through United Way. Um, currently right now, we have emergency food and shelter program known as EFSP, and that is for uh, shelters, food programs, um, things like that. Um, that is administered by Brenta Santiago, that's FEMA money. So if you want information on that, please reach out to Brenda. You can find her on our website. Um, in the past as well, we've had two generation money um, that is available. We did a program expansion in 2022 for those partners. Um, we will not be doing an additional expansions this year, but look forward to next year um, because we may have two gen expansion next year. Um, throughout the year, we have opportunities for capacity building programs. And so we email those out. Um, so just be looking for those opportunities. And then, of course, if you're interested in affordable housing through our McKinsey Scott dollars, those are on an invitation only basis. So just reach out to us to get more information. Um, again, in a few minutes, we will show you the um, hub page so you can see where that's located. Again, that's a great opportunity to connect with other United Way partner agencies. Um, but all the information that we have here today, the virtual information session that we're recording, if you want to share with someone in your office, or if it's just so great, you want to watch it again, it'll be posted there um, along with the packet of information, links to the EC Impact database, and hopefully everything you need. So um, again, Will and I will be available for questions. We do ask that you funnel your questions through us um, rather than reaching out to other United Way staff folks. Um, we just want everyone to have the same consistent message in what we've heard that aligns with our investment committee and our volunteers. So we don't want you talking to someone else and then accidentally getting advice that doesn't align with the um, actual RFP process. Um, one caveat this year is that we're not going to be available for full read throughs of applications. But once you've had a chance to get in and look at the frequently asked questions, get into the database, um, we'll be happy to walk you through any specific budget or program or application questions that you have. Um, we just ask that you uh, reach out to us at a time and then uh, be specific about um, you know, what you're asking. Um, what we have done this year is we've added a lot more examples of how to answer the questions. Um, so again, we're here to give you kind of those helpful hints of what we've heard that the volunteers like to see and hear in the applications, um, just so that will help you round out your responses a little bit more thoroughly. 
So I am going to go through again uh, the frequently asked questions that was in the packet. So if you are old school and printed them out like I did, or if you're following on a screen, I'm just going to hit a few of these just to give a few more details. So again, this is the 2024 process for funding that will start on July 1st. Um, again, we are requesting proposals in the areas of um, basic needs and then pathways to resiliency. In the RFP packet, it does have a full listing of those eligible activities. And we'll talk a little bit about this in a second, but you can apply for general operating support. Uh, we do not have percentages or caps on uh, things like direct services or operating costs or admin, things like that, because quite frankly, we know that you need to pay the accountant or you might need a percentage of money to pay your light bill of your agency. And that's OK. We want you to be able to cover those kind of things. And a lot of grant sources um, restrict grant funding only to direct services. And we know it can be hard, frankly, to raise money for those other things you need. And quite frankly, we want you to have an accountant. So if that's what you need to apply for with us. That's OK. What we do ask is that you will you have a program that can report on the outcomes and indicators in our catalog and do align with the eligible activities under basic needs and building resiliency. And so we'll see what questions you have on that in just a second. Um, but it is a again a single application that you will apply through, even if you have more than one program you're looking to support. Uh, it's a tiered application. So uh, programs less than 15,000 have a pretty straightforward, um, pretty easy uh, to complete application. Um, as you go into the mid tier, which is applications up to 75,000, those get a little bit more rigorous. Uh, you are going to have more documentation that will ask you uh, to submit, such as a copy of an independent audit based on your total revenue size or the amount of money that you're asking for. When you get to tier three, those are 75 to 200,000. And again, 200 is our cap on funding requests. Um, that requires you know, a lot more documentation. We're going to ask a few more questions that are not asked of the other grantees, and that goes into if your program is evidence-based or evidence-informed, your approaches to using trauma-informed care, and things like that. And, and again, we will require an independent audit, uh, no matter the size of the revenue, um, just simply based on the size of the grant. Um, so again, going through our deadlines, March 15th is when these grants are due through the EC Impact database. And again, in just a moment, Will's going to show you the database and make sure you feel comfortable uh, setting up your program. Uh, we will have funding awards announced on or before May 16th, and these are for programs that start July 1st. So a couple more things just to go through real quick. When you get to the application, you will see there's an option to select being considered for women in philanthropy. So WIP is one of our engagement networks, and that is our donors who are specifically interested in supporting the increased financial stability for women and women with children. Uh, WIP is a great opportunity. You get additional social media and other kinds of exposure uh, through their separate communications channels through us, but then also you have um, the experience and the wealth of all of their volunteers to support you in your program. So again, if you have a program that's specifically targeting increasing financial stability for women and women with children, then you might want to select being considered for WIP. Um, you would just simply check the box and there's a super brief paragraph that you'll tell us why you'd like to be considered. Uh, keep in mind they are looking for volunteer opportunities for their members, so that is something that your agency would need to provide. How that works is um, folks that uh, opt in to be selected by women in philanthropy, those applications will be reviewed first. If you're either not selected or not selected the full amount that you were requesting, then we will kick those applications back out to the regular review pool. So it just gives you an opportunity again to amplify uh, the work um, of those WIP volunteers. So um, how are funding decisions made in general? So we use trained volunteers to score the applications and um, as we go through we'll give you some helpful hints of things that we know that our volunteers like to see um, then after the applications are scored that goes through a uh, investment committee that we have here at united way when it gets to the investment committee they may opt to do some points adjustments so for example if you are based in a rural area serving that rural area or if you're based in Richland, Lexington, providing rural-based services, they may elect to give a small bonus point there. 
Uh, we've done that for the last couple of years to help us make sure that we can allocate our resources equally across our um, six counties based on the dollars raised. Um, also, they will take into prior program performance. So there could be uh, reductions, uh, uh, points taken away. If you've struggled with um, allocating excuse me, administering a program through United Way donor resources. So that could be a prior impact grant. That could be a McKenzie Scott grant. That could be anything, including our Jumpstart grants. So if you've had a difficulty, again, administering donor resources that we've previously allocated, the investment committee may make a points reduction. So just be aware of that. Um, as I said before, uh, we will consider general operating support. Um, you know, we know that you need to pay the account and again, we want you to have an account. So that is eligible, but you do need to align to one of our program areas and be able to report to us according to our catalog of outcomes and indicators. We do also ask that you have a healthy mix of funding. So what does that mean? Healthy mix means that no more than 50% of your agency budget, if you're a smaller agency or 50% of your program budget, is allocated um, with United Way resources. We want you to have other funding um, for sustainability purposes. Let's see here. There is not a match requirement. Um, if you're one of our two generation programs, you'll know that we do require a match there that is not required for these impact pool resources. Um, and again, we've talked about the general operating support. So I think right there, um, I'm gonna pause and Will, if you wanna pull up the database, we will start walking through the questions and how to set things up. All right, if y'all could just bear with me for just a moment while I share my screen. Uh, thank you again for everyone being on this call. It's great to see so many agencies represented. All right, Jennifer, can you confirm you can see my screen for me? I can see your screen. Thank you very much. All right, um, I recognize that we have several agencies that have had some staffing turnover, so I'm gonna go real very much step uh, step by step on uh, how to get to this application just to make sure that uh, everyone knows how to access. And so um, I believe that everyone on this call was able to uh, access the link in the RFP through the nonprofits page on our website. And that's also where you will go to access the application um, through EC Impact. And so just as a quick tutorial of how to get there, if you lose the link that, I, that you were sent, if you go to our main website, which is ua.org, go to this menu in the top right hand corner and underneath get involved, you'll see the option for nonprofits. And that we're gonna click there and it's gonna take us to our nonprofits page. Uh, if you scroll down, uh, you'll see the community impact partners, you have partner login. And also this is where you access that RFP uh, I believe uh, is where everyone accessed it uh, this time around. Uh, to access uh, EC Impact, um, you could do that one of two ways. One is actually on the RFP. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, which conveniently my uh, document already is, uh, you can click where it says apply now for competitive impact funding. That will take you to the login page. But just for day-to-day -day usage and reporting and applications, you can always go to the nonprofits page and click on partner login. And this will take you to a login screen and you'll notice that it says United Way of the Midlands on there. Um, a, a common issue that I've seen with people logging into EC Impact is sometimes they'll go to try to log in and it will prompt them for a organization code. Uh, if it's asking you, ever asking you for an organization code, it means that you are on the general EC Impact login and not the United Way of the Midlands login. Uh, if you use the link that's on the nonprofits page, it will always take you to this page uh, and it'll get you logged in as quickly as possible. So I'm gonna log in here. Actually, even before I log in, um, uh, you, if you ever lose your password, you can of course contact us about it, but it also has this having trouble signing in feature where you can uh, try to reset that on your own. But I'm gonna go ahead and sign in. And this is a pretty bare bones uh, demo page. So your page might look different. Um, it might have a lot more going on in the left-hand menus. It might have some uh, graphs and things on the, uh, on the home page. But uh, this, this is just the bare bones just to kind of show you uh, where everything is. Um, first of all, if you need, if you're accessing your EC Impact page, 
uh, and you need to give other people in your organization access, you're, uh, anyone with ac uh, login access is able to uh, add, add contacts to this page and also give them login access. So to do that, you would look in the, uh, your agency box up in the top left-hand corner uh, and underneath where it says agency profile, you can go to contacts. And right now I'm the only contact listed for this demo page, but if I wanted to add Jennifer, I'd be able to click on add new and I can say if I want her to be the primary contact or if I want her to be included on all emails and I'm able to fill in all the information uh, that uh, we need for her contact. And of course, if you want them to be able to have login access, you click that checkbox at the bottom for uh, granting them login access. And so I'm gonna go back to the home page. Uh, to access the application, you will go to the left-hand menu and there is a box titled apply report, which if you have uh, are currently receiving funding, this is also the box where you'll see uh, your different reports, like your quarterly report, your mid-year report, uh, any year report, all those happen here. But to access any of open applications, you just click where it says, click here for open applications. So I'm gonna click there. And right, uh, right in the middle of the screen, you can see that it says impact grant application. Since that's the only option, um, it is already pre-selected. So I'm gonna click continue. And then just gonna click complete registration and it will tell you, thank you. The grant process will now appear on your homepage. So I'm gonna hit continue one more time and it has brought me back to my homepage. And you can see now that the grant application, uh, the link for the application is now um, uh, right at the top where it wasn't before. So I'm gonna click, excuse me, click that link uh, to get us going. And right away you can see that there's not really any forms ready for you. That's because there's not a program assigned to this page. Uh, in order to do, uh, to submit an application, you need to assign a program uh, to the application. And we've set it up to where we want only new programs to be assigned. So to do that, to create a program, you're gonna to go to this right-hand menu where it says assign programs to this and click create a new program. Uh, before I do that, I wanna note that I said that we have said, please include the grant cycle or the year within the program title, just so we uh, can track that a little better in the system. So I'm gonna say create a new program. I'm just gonna say, Test 24, 25, and I'm gonna skip all this other information for now. Click save, click, com click complete, and click continue. And now you can see that um, we have that same page, but now I have my forms populated. And also you can see in the left-hand menu where it says apply report, uh, we now have the option where our grant is located. Um, and so now I'm going to walk through each of these sections uh, pretty quickly. Um, and I think Jennifer might jump in and help me on some of the uh, some of the different narrative questions that we're asking. The application is split into four parts. It is program narrative, uh, uh, program budget, budget narrative, and performance measures. And so we're gonna start with the program narrative. And if you fill out a, uh, any form with us before, this will look familiar. If this is your first time, it's uh, hopefully it's not the most intimidating thing you've ever seen. Uh, we are gonna ask for just the contact information for the person filling out the application, as well as executive director and board chair contact information. Uh, we request those things because if you're selected to receive funding, then we will be submitting a uh, funding, uh, funding agreement, a contract, and that needs to be signed by both the executive director and the board chair of your organization. And so if we already have that information, it makes the process go a lot smoother. Um, let's see, uh, total amount requested, tier that you're selecting, um, funding category. And so here it goes back to what Jennifer was talking about with those uh, different tiers that you can apply under. Uh, for the sake of this demonstration, I'm gonna do tier three, just so we can see all the content uh, that is available uh, that, that will be on these applications. Um, Jennifer mentioned that tier three will have a few extra questions and we'll make sure to point out which questions only appear on the tier three applications and not on the tier one and two. You would also select your funding category. And so that could be safety net, pathways of resiliency, or both, uh, depending on what you'd wanna do. And then once you do that, we have your strategies that you'd select underneath it. 
uh, depending on what exactly is the program that you're applying with. All right, so then we get into program information, which is a, uh, a few questions shouldn't be too foreign for you for filling out any of the uh, any sort of grant application. So we're going to want a description of your organization, um, which the reason we do this is because, um, as Jennifer said, these uh, applications are reviewed by teams of volunteers uh, from the community, and not all volunteers are familiar with every agency. And so we want to make sure that whoever is reviewing your application has a, uh, is able to understand who your organization is, what your organization does, and we do that by asking for just a brief description with that. And then once you've provided that, then we get into actually describing the program that you are applying with. Um, we ask for a brief program description that's just a two to three sentence summary of this is what this uh, program is, this is what it does. And then we ask for a more detailed explanation of what goes into the program, including uh, objectives and the expected impact that it will have. Uh, a question that we've added this year uh, uh, that was not on the application last year is this uh, this question that says, please describe the rationale for the amount requested. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to explain this one a little more? Yeah, so this was something that, um, again, our volunteers love to see details. Um, they love to see anything that's uh, data supporting the request. Um, so cost data, um, anything like that. So again, we have some examples there in the question um, that you can kind of let us know the rationale for the cost. Um, one thing to keep in mind is I would avoid uh, really high level general answers to this question. Um, and what I mean by that is gear, uh, funding is not guaranteed from year to year. So we do have an annual application process. So I really, <clears throat> excuse me, I would avoid uh, questions such as I'm applying for this much because this is how much I got last year. I would I would really avoid answers like that because we've seen similar answers in the past and that has not scored well with our volunteers. So anything that you can do to show us, you know, cost per person, if you've had increased costs, if you are maybe expanding to a new service that you haven't offered previously, if you can tell us why you're doing that and um, you know, the cost associated with that. If you've lost funding from another source, that's okay. Um, we just want to understand um, how that has impacted the program. So again, um, I'd really avoid kind of really general answers to that question. I'd really kind of be thoughtful. Um, we write lots of, lots of grants here for our direct programs, and we know that when we build that budget, there is a rationale behind it. So if you don't mind, just share that with us. Um, that would be really helpful. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Um, we also ask you to report on our, how the program addresses root causes, and if you're um, just to help uh, help us all understand what we're talking about when we say root causes. If you hover over that little bubble or um, with a question mark, it kind of tells you what we're uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about root causes. And so, anytime you see that little green bubble with question mark, there's a little more uh, information if you hover over that bubble, just to help make sure everyone can understand um, everything that we're looking for. Um, let's see. We want information on uh, comparing, complementing services. Uh, whether this is a new existing program, uh, lessons learned, uh, of course, um, all the typical things that we've included in previous applications. Uh, then we get down to the bottom of this section and these final three questions that you see, uh, these are the ones that are going to be specific, oh, specific to our tier three applicants. And so we have uh, the discuss how the program model is evidence-based or evidence-formed. So we want to know about those practices. And if you have a model that you are basing your program on, uh, we want you to please name that or name that model, cite that model. Um, we also ask for uh, a detailed uh, process for evaluating the programs um, and what uh, telling us what sort of improvements have been made to the program or the organization as a result of that evaluation. Um, we also ask uh, you to report on uh, how the organization incorporates trauma-informed care into this program. So those three questions, evidence-based, trauma-informed, and pr uh, detailed program evaluation, those are going to be your, uh, your extra questions for your Tier 3 applications. Uh, Jennifer, did you want to add anything with those? Yeah, just to remember, on Tier 3, um, again, we're probably going to have our more experienced volunteers reviewing our Tier 3 applications. Um, 
and th this may be a volunteer if you've applied in the past they may have um, looked at your application previously as well or your final report um, this is a great opportunity to really talk about uh, what data is collected, how you collect the data, how you use that data, and then if you've made program changes, why did you make those changes based on the data, and then did you see a difference that you can find a correlation to the data? Um, that's a really, these three questions are a really great opportunity for our Tier 3 applicants really to give us lots of detail. Um, so with all of these, and we'll talk about this with the, the budget narrative as well, um, back in school and they say show your work when you're when you're in math class, um, our volunteers love to see um, those details explained. And so this is a great opportunity to, to do that. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, let's see. Uh, then we get into target population. Um, we want to know who you expect to serve with this program, uh, including demographic information. And we also want to know uh, about how those uh, populations access services provided by the program. So we want to know about who it is that you're serving and how they're accessing. Uh, and then uh, something that will look a little bit different this year compared to previous years is our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion section, our DEI section. Uh, and I'm also going to shift over to Jennifer to talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, so previously this was one question um, and we we found that sometimes we got some very general answers here. So uh, we worked with our investment committee who looks at every single question that we ask. Um, and what we did end up doing is dividing this into two questions. So the first question is going to be based at your organizational level. And again, you can see in the example there, we want to give you um, some things that came directly from our volunteers of things that they were looking for. Um, in a response. And then the second question is at the program level. Um, so again, I, I would avoid kind of general kind of high level answers. So um, we know that, you know, you might be a basic needs agency and we've seen responses to this question before that kind of say we serve anyone who comes to our door. Well, we hope you do serve every, anyone that comes to your door. However, if you could be a little bit more in depth and tell us, so we understand that you serve everybody that you have capacity to serve as they come to your door, but how do you learn about these folks? How do you how do you get their feedback on the program uh, to get their you know their input and their insight? Um, how do you tailor the program for um, the specific population that you may be uh, typically serving? How do you improve accessibility, program design, and things like that? So, so again, we understand, especially with a lot of our basic needs programs, you are serving whoever shows up at the door. Um, but I, I would be a little bit more thoughtful in the answers. Um, you know, kind of again, giving that a little bit more detailed into the program operations. Um, that is what we found to be more uh, responsive with our volunteers when they're doing scoring. Excellent. All right, thank you, Jennifer. And then rounding out the bottom of this page is that WIP section that Jennifer was discussing earlier from the RFP, that if you are interested in being considered for uh, WIP funding, then this is the checkbox that you would check. And then just give us a little brief explanation of uh, how your program aligns with uh, with uh, with women in philanthropy. Women in philanthropy. Um, just I'm not going to be able to do it necessarily right now because I haven't filled in any of these spots. But once you've completed this form in any form on the application, uh, you want to make sure that you save your work. And if you are if you have answered all the questions to your satisfaction and you're ready, and you're you're ready to submit this page. Make sure you click save my work and, and mark as complete. Um, uh, I'm sure most of you have had experience with this before, but just in case you haven't, uh, in order to submit your app, uh, your application, all parts of the application have to be marked as completed for the submit button to be able to populate. And so um, this is that option right here. But just for the sake of this tutorial, we're gonna go back through the previous page and you can see that it's already tracking my progress. Um, we'll go down to the proposed program budget which uh, is pretty straightforward. Um, we want the top section is expenditures from United Way to Midlands. So this is uh, with those with that funding amount that you were requesting, basically how you would break that down uh, into the, these three spending categories, which is direct staffing, direct service, and uh, operations administration. We also uh, ask for you to report on expenditures from other sources. So this is a, an opportunity for you to be able to demonstrate that uh, that healthy mix of funding 
uh, so you can show where other uh, where other funding sources are contributing to this program as well. Um, this is not uh, for you to be able to demonstrate that there's a match. There's not, as Jennifer talked about, there's not a match expectation of this, but we do want to, you to be able to demonstrate that mixed uh, that mixed funding. Um, and then this is, we'll just give you the total program budget. This is an automatic section that you don't have to complete. It'll um, add all the things together as you're doing it. And again, once you finish, save and mark is complete. Going to the budget narrative, this is just an opportunity for you to be able to explain those sections a little bit further. Uh, so, um, so going into like the direct staffing expenditures, the direct service expenditures, operating administrative expenditures, uh, this is where you will be able to go in and provide a little more detail about where, uh, where those dollar amounts are going. Um, Jennifer, did you want to say anything to this section? Yeah, just so uh, just remember, um, show your work just like math class. Uh, so our volunteers typically like to see um, for staff positions, uh, the title, the percentage of the FTE and then the total cost. Um, this would apply to all everything. So if you're applying for anything under the administrative, um, we've seen in the past agencies, um, you know, might get slightly lower scoring if they say, you know, one accountant, you know, one executive director, one administrative assistant, but they don't give further details. So our volunteers do like to see details. Um, again, we don't have uh, percentages or caps on the categories. So again, we want you to apply for what you need to make the program uh, run successfully as long as you have those outcomes and indicators that we can report out to. Um, the healthy mix as well, the 50%, again, if you're a smaller agency, um, this shouldn't. our funding shouldn't be more than 50% of your total budget. If you're a larger agency with multiple programs, it should not be more than 50% of a program. And it does apply to individual positions. So for example, if you're um, putting a case manager position in here, we'd like to be no more than half of that person's total cost with fringe and uh, fringe and salary, uh, just for sustainability purposes. So that's something that, again, our volunteers um, you know, understand that you need funding in different areas, including general operating support, but they just wanna be clear on how you'd like to use the dollars. Yes. And just to build on what Jennifer was saying, um, uh, it's just another tip for for as you're writing this application that remembering that the reviewers are volunteers, um, most, if not all of them are also donors. And so they do care about uh, where their donor where donor dollars are going and they're very mindful of that. And so this is an opportunity for you to really um, uh, dive into what the what those donor dollars are going to be doing in this program. Um, and so as Jennifer said, details great. Uh, our, our reviewers uh, really appreciate it when um, they can see detail in, um, in the budget. So I'm going to go back to the previous page and go down to the last section, which is performance measures, which if you haven't done this before, this is probably the most confusing page out of all the pages. Um, but I think it's, it more looks intimidating than it actually is. Uh, so just to, to give you an idea of, of where we're going to go. Uh, these labels, so you have like food insecurity, healthcare, behavioral healthcare, the, these labels are uh, the different strategies um, that you're able to select from back on that program narrative page. So when you click on like the drop downs for the tiers um, and like the, the application area and the strategies, these are, this is, these are where those come from. And so whatever you selected on that first page, that's what you're going to report on. Uh, on the performance measures. So if you selected that you are a uh, behavioral health care, for instance, um, if your uh, program is behaving, um, providing behavioral health care to the community, then we're going to ask that you report on outcomes and indicators underneath behavioral outcome on the performance measures page. Um, if you would, please um, read through the instructions while you're going through this page. It's going to really help uh, help to understand uh, what exactly um, is going to be expected of you. But just for the demonstration, I'm going to click on this uh, plus button. Uh, and this says, please select the outcome. And you can see conveniently there's only one outcome and there will only be one outcome for each of these areas. Um, this is just the process that this system works with. Um, uh, so it's pretty easy, straightforward that you only have one outcome to choose from. 
uh, once you've selected an outcome, you click save my work and continue, and then that's going to take you into the indicator section. And so these are the actual things that we're going to be asking you to re uh, uh, to report on. Um, if uh, if there is some uh, an item that is pre-selected and you can't unselect it, that means that is a indicator that is required for all tiers uh, for the application. And so as you can see up in the uh, up in the instructions up here, it says that tier one, two, and three applications are all expected to report on this. So it's already been pre-selected. So you don't have uh, to select um, anything additionally if you're just applying under a tier one. But if you are a tier two, we do ask for the specific in, um, uh, strategy that uh, the instructions indicate to choose one additional indicator to report on. And if you're a tier three, uh, we ask that you report on all indicators. And so since I had put tier three earlier on. I'm going to select all three. I'm going to save my work and continue. And then it is going to open up the actual reporting uh, component of it, which this is an application. So we're just asking you on uh, to report on proposed numbers. And so for each indicator that you've just selected, it will ask you to report on your, purpo your proposed number enrolled and your proposed number that will be achieving the indicator. And so Enrolled means simply that is how many people will be participating in, in the program that will be uh, uh, going towards this measure. Um, what we mean when we say achieving indicator is uh, how many of the enrolled participants do you expect to be successful in the indicator? So for this one, the client metrics are captured across multiple areas of individual functioning. Um, how many of the enrolled participants um, will successfully have metrics captured across those areas of functioning is what that's asking. And then if and you select, yes. I was going to say, and real quick, and just remember your, your number enrolled, if, say if you have three different indicators, your number enrolled is not going to change. So that's the number of people who are initially participating in your intervention or your program, and they may have different um you know, outcomes that you're reporting based on the different strategies, but your that baseline number is not going to change. All right. Thank you. And just to help you make sure you're on the right track, your achieving indicator number should always be equal to or less than your enrolled number. Uh, there should not be a, an instance where your uh, achieving indicator number is larger than your enrollment number. All right. And so you would do that for each of those uh, indicators that you selected. Um, and again, once you have finished, there's that option for save my work and mark is completed. Uh, you have the option to save your work and come back at any time. Um, and if you accidentally exit out of any uh, exit out of anything, uh, and when you come back to the page, this is what it would look like. Or if you stop working, uh, need to come back later uh, to finish it. Anything that is uh, that needs to be completed will have this uh, yellow exclamation point next to it. And so that helps you kind of keep track of the things that have started that have not been completed yet. And so to continue working on those, you just go back and click on that edit button and it'll bring that screen right back up. The other part of this, uh, this screen is once you've done uh, whatever strategy or strategies uh, with the outcomes indicators that you've selected, uh, if you scroll down to the very bottom, the one that is in all uh, capital uh, letters, all uppercase letters. It says data collection process for all outcomes indicators. This last option is required for all applications. Um, and so regardless of what strategy you selected, uh, we need you to complete this. Um, you'll remember that when we selected the strategy that it told us to select an outcome and there was just the one outcome, uh, whatever that outcome was that you selected, uh, you'll just select that. So I know that this one was client proofs and maintains health, so I'm going to save and continue. And then it's actually going to bring us to the actual data collection questions that we have. Um, and so those that we have for you are, uh, how do you participants become enrolled? So basically, we want to know how, how did you define that number for enrollment? Um, and then how will you uh, track progress towards achieving those indicators? So what tools and methods are you using uh, to track that, that progress to, towards achieving those indicators? And again, uh, detail is always is always great for our reviewers. They always like it. They like context. Um, so any uh, any of those details that you can include are, uh, will be well received by the review teams. So right now I'm going to close this window and return to the overview page. And once you have completed all those sections and you save them all and mark them as completed, then a big shiny red button that says submit 
will pop up um, and then that's how you do your final submission. Uh, Jennifer, is there anything that I might have glanced over? No, um, I know there's a lot of clicking, um, yes. but if you need help, we're here. <laughs> um, so uh, just, uh, and again, the, the little bubbles, little question marks, those are going to give additional context um, and helpful hints and things like that. Um, the RFP document or the, the questions themselves also have those examples. So uh, where you do see, for example, and it gives you um, some ideas of things to report on, again, those came directly from our volunteers when they were um, working through the uh, wordsmith, wordsmithing, if you will, of the application itself. Um, so those are in there to be helpful. Um, just the other thing, um, we've seen this happen before um, uh, several times. Uh, I know it can you're you're waiting on that one little last piece of data. So you put in all caps, add data here or or get information from my colleague or something like that. And it's really easy to forget to go back and complete those sections. So um, I always just say if you have someone in the office that can read behind you, just do a quick read through before you submit it. That's always helpful. Uh, just to catch those little tiny details that you know you might have missed um, during the application process. We just always think that's helpful for folks. All right, so I think Will's going to stop sharing the screen. And then um, I know Will talks fast and I talk even faster. So we're going to see what questions you have. Feel free just to come off a of mute if you'd like. Hey, Will, this is Mac Bennett. If uh, if you try to submit an application that is incomplete, it's going to the system's going to tell you what is missing. Right. And so um, just like you saw. Here, I'll share my screen one more time just because I still have it pulled up. Uh, as you can see uh, how it shows like the in prog or the status. Yep. Uh, so. Um, it will for you to be able to submit every the status for each form will need to say um, marked as complete or completed. Um, and so it will show you if, if there's anything that hasn't been finished, it will show up as in progress. Um, and so um, uh, again, if if there's anything that has not been marked as completed, the submission button won't even be available. Um, so it's only once you have gone through and saved everything and marked as complete is when you will actually be able to submit. And so if it's missing anything, it'll show you which form is in progress. Um, and so you should be able to go into those forms and find the, the, the missing sections. Okay. Right, it's a great question. Well, I guess it's good afternoon now. This is Brenda Jamerson. How are you all? Hey, Brenda. Hey, Brenda. Hi. I have a question in reference. If you you said it's one application and you're submitting one amount that would cover different parts. Mm -hmm. So in the in the performance measures and whatever, you're explaining how if you're submitting for two different things, how that's included in the performance measures i'm not quite sure correct so yeah so it'll give you the opportunity to select additional measures um i i would say for most agencies that's not too too common because typically you know the agents or the programs within your agencies are typically connected and they typically align with those strategies and the outcomes and indicators um, but every once in a while, you'll have an agency that does lots of different things. And so you you may have that come up. Um, but I think I think for Samaritan House, I think uh, typically y'all will probably fall under that housing and sheltering, which also includes case management. OK, and last question in reference to the enrolled um, under the performance measures. And so enrolled the number that we inspect and anticipate to be enrolled during the year, during that year's period of time. That's yes, what you're during, Yeah, the program year, which is July 1 uh, through June 30th of the following okay. year. Okay, all right, thank you. I thought I saw the DM have a hand up, yes. If you, Deanne, if you're talking, we can't hear you. You might be mute or your microphone is not working. 
you can also put it in the chat and we'll, we'll take a look there for some reason if, if the microphone's just not working today. see uh jennifer did you talk about um oh never mind sorry dan just put it in the chat so we'll go go for her. uh dan says can you explain trauma informed sure um and that again that's only for the tier three applications um so again those three additional questions which was if you are evidence-based or evidence-informed telling us about that and the model that you're based off of uh, trauma-informed care and the third one, which I'm not remembering right now, Will, but I'm sure he will in a second. Um, yeah, trauma-informed care is just how you um, get at the model and you can definitely Google that. Cause I mean, we, we want you to be using um, uh, uh, practices such as this, um, but this is just recognizing um, how you deliver your services in a way that um, are respectful to the, um, the emotional and supportive needs of your clients. And thanks for putting that in the chat. Mm -hmm. All right, what else, y'all? All right, and Jennifer, what if anyone wants uh, us to review any uh, anything about their application? Have we discussed that? talked about we're not okay. doing complete read throughs this year um uh just based on our staff capacity that we have here with the number of folks available uh which would be will and me um but we are happy once you've looked through the frequently asked questions and had a chance to get into the uh, ec impact database again those little uh, question marks when you click on those it does give you additional instructions on completing any of these um, but if you have a question on uh, the budget or um, how to answer a specific question we're happy to talk with you um, just reach out to us send us an email um, and we can just set up a time to get on the phone or get on a team's call Okay, last call for questions. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining today. And again, thank you for everything that you do every single day for our Midlands community. Um, we appreciate every single one of you and your agencies and um, for being a part of United Way. Um, so again, if and by the way, if you are a CEO, remember CEO Association is uh, this week on the 14th. We'd love to see you there. It's Valentine's Day, 1030 in our building. There's also a virtual link. All right, anything else, Will? Oh, sorry, just just buzzes in the chat. And so just people saying thank you, that's great. But yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, and and again, at CEO Association, we'll, um, Elliot will probably talk about the, the partner hub again as well. Um, so we'll make sure to get that information to you where we will also be hosting information, uh, other, um, the same information uh, for the RFP and everything will also be on that partner hub. So you'll be able to access it more than one place. But All right, everybody have a great day. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. All right, thanks. Bye.